Hello, and thank you for joining us to listen, learn, and provide input on DCPS's FY22 budget model shift, which will fund schools for school year 2021-2022. We appreciate you taking the time to engage during this time. My name is Alan Francois, and I am the director of the school finance team at DCPS. Here with me today is hopefully another familiar face, Anne DeCourt, a specialist on the school finance team. We thank you in advance for listening and providing feedback through the tabs on this public input site. We hope this video helps you understand and access the material so that you feel equipped to provide meaningful and authentic feedback. The window for public input is open through Friday, September 4th. We have three objectives for today's video. Number one, we want to give you an update on our findings and considerations for a new budget model. Number two, build a stronger understanding of the different models under consideration for DCPS's new school budget model. Number three, share potential policy changes that we want your input and comments on. <clears throat> As we kick off a new school year at DC Public Schools, our commitment to ensuring every student feels loved, challenged, and prepared to reach their full potential and thrive in life has not wavered. Throughout the coronavirus COVID-19 public health emergency, DCPS has remained focused on the health and safety of our school community. And we are prepared to deliver on our commitment to a safe return to learning for every student this fall. At the same time, we remain strategically and intentionally focused on ensuring the district's long-term success. Over the past several years, DCPS has seen steady gains in student achievement on PARC. The number of DCPS students scoring at a level four or a level five has increased by 15 percentage points in Eng English language arts and 11.5 percentage points in math since 2015. While we have seen tremendous growth among nearly all of our students, we have much more work to do to support our students and empower principals to use resources in a more flexible manner to improve student outcomes. The shift to a new budget model is grounded in the feedback we've heard from the DCPS community. From the outset of this project, we have focused on three priorities, equity, financial sustainability, and transparency. We started by conducting a financial review and resource study on how we use our resources. We did this with the help of a partner nonprofit organization, Education Resource Strategies, also known as ERS. ERS is an expert organization in school finance that has experience working with school districts across the country. This work was possible through philanthropy provided by the Ed Fund. The findings from the financial review, which we'll share more about, helped us refine what we are addressing. Based on community and staff feedback, we have heard DCPS's next model should build upon current strengths and address current weaknesses, including number one, continuing to improve funding equity across schools and student needs. Number two, significantly improving transparency so stakeholders understand both what they get and why they get it. And number three, providing principals with the right kinds of flexibility over critical resource decisions and the support to use those flexibilities to make the best decisions for students. <clears throat> These guiding questions in our three focus areas helped us in this work. For equity, we asked, is the current comprehensive staffing model yielding the results and student outcomes that we want? For financial sustainability, how do we create a model that is financially sustainable given the reality of rising costs? And for transparency, how do we help our stakeholders track dollars so they can make the best decisions for students? We approached this work through a three-step process. The first step, building understanding across all budget stakeholders. The second step, designing a new model. And the final step, building the new model. 
We will grow, go through today's presentation in this same way. We are going to first ensure understanding by reviewing the findings, then talk about possible design options, and leave the window open to collect your input through the feedback tabs on this public input site. <clears throat> first, I'd like to share some historical context on DCPS's allocation models. DCPS launched a student-based budgeting model in the late 1990s. This model allocated dollars to schools based on student demographics. However, its implementation resulted in a lack of consistency in school programming across the city. In response to concerns that schools with decreasing enrollment were unable to fund core educational programming, DCPS launched the comprehensive staffing model. This model was intended to establish a floor of consistency across all schools. We acknowledge that there is growing dissatisfaction with the comprehensive staffing model. Community members have often shared that it is difficult to understand how dollars flow to schools. With the Ed Fund Philanthropy, DCPS conducted a third party resource use study in the fall of 2019 that looked at FY18 or school year 2017-2018 budget data, which was the most recent year for which financial expenditures were available. Education Resource Strategies, our partner and an expert in school finance, finance conducted the study. We are going to share some findings from this study to frame some potential changes we are considering going forward. Although DCPS is relatively high funded and has made a series of strategic investments in recent years, it must do more to improve outcomes among low income students of color, English language learners, and students with disabilities. For example, Let's look at how varying school populations could affect how schools are funded and how this is calculated by looking at the poverty weight for a student who is eligible for free or reduced lunch. You can see that DCPS spends $14,550 per pupil for students receiving free or reduced lunch and $951 less for students not eligible for free or reduced lunch. In this example, we can therefore calculate that we spend 7% more on economically disadvantaged students. To control for varying student needs, we create a dollar per weighted pupil figure for each school by adjusting school enrollment with the derived weights for all student populations. Let's simplify the numbers and weights to explain this concept and how it can be applied to weighted student funding. This means if a school has 100 students and 10 are English language learners, and it is 50% more costly to support these students, five students are added to the enrollment in this calculation. A school would effectively be funded at 105 students at the base rate to account for the additional needs of the English language learner. One key finding from the resource study is that DCPS invests proportionally more in at-risk, mostly low-income students, than peer districts. The top row in this table is DCPS. The red shaded row is the peer median. We are spending more than our peers by almost $3,000. We still have an opportunity going forward to improve how we support at-risk students and to be intentional in our new model about how we fund weights for various student groups. A general education student in DCPS with no additional need or risk factors is funded on average at $13,600 per student. We also designate resources to serve specific student groups. The values you see here are what the weight of those is re relative to general education and how that compares to peer districts. While the previous slides show that there has been growth in student outcomes during the period of the CSM, there are also limitations to the model. Here is one limitation of the model, variation in spending that is not necessarily intentional on the part of the district. As background, as part of the resource use study, our resource partner considered spending among DCPS schools. 
This slide shows that the CSM has resulted in limited variation among elementary schools, but more variation among secondary schools. As in most school districts, school level resources adjusted for student need vary across DCPS. In DC, this variation is driven primarily by school size. Variation is most acute among secondary schools, most of which serve fewer than 500 students. We see that high schools have a premium $6,200 in per student spending after adjusting for need in small versus non-small schools. In this case, premium means that we spend $6,200 more per student in some secondary schools. Because small schools are especially common in wards five, six, seven, and eight, schools in these wards often receive more resources on a per pupil basis than other schools. In DC, the CSM accounts for 72% of variation in need adjusted per pupil funding in elementary schools and 82% in secondary schools. We are looking at this metric because after adjusting for student need, many districts want to see more schools within 10% of median. Best practice among urban districts is closer to 60 to 70% per our resource partner experts. It is important to recall here that DCPS first launched the CSM to establish a floor of consistency across all schools. However, the CSM we have now is not the CSM we started with almost a decade ago. It has grown over time. As the CSM gives every school fixed amounts of various allocations, for example, one registrar, we end up seeing more staff per student at smaller schools. For, ele for elementary schools, small schools have almost 11 more staff per 350 students than non-small schools. The actual number of staff for elementary schools is 71.6 staff for a small school and 60.9 for average or large schools. At the high school level, the difference is greater. Small high schools have approximately 28 more staff per 500 students than non-small schools. The actual number of staff is 89.8 for small schools and 62 for average or large high schools. What you don't see on here are middle schools. 92% of DCPS's middle schools are small schools or schools with less than 500 students as defined by ERS. So there was less variation by school size. Small schools are a challenge in any CSM, and our challenge is compounded by a lot of small schools, particularly in wards five, six, seven, and eight. This helps explains why we see much higher per student spending in our small schools. On the screen, you can see the trade-offs in our current state. We have both bright spots as well as opportunities for growth. With these opportunities in mind, let's now turn to options for designing our new school budget model.